Enrique Becerra is a postdoc here at the University of Miami. Uh, he, what you could say, is, is one of the uh, of, of, of roots of the relation between Sintestad and the University of Miami. Uh, he studied in, in Mexico City at the Sintestad, the, the guidance of Ernesto, and now he's here at the, at the University of Miami uh, as a postdoc. So we see already fruits of, uh, of a constant collaboration. Just to finish, I was thinking today, why, 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 what, why in Latin America we don't move as fast? We should. When I was showering, <laughs> and, and then I got to this uh, example: we, we, we change too much policies, right? too much all the time. Whatever policy is in place by whatever president, no matter what. Four years later comes the other one, and see this is not a policy. Got it, whatever it is, then comes the next one is not. There is no possible way to evolve if you are in constant change. Whatever you do, you think for projects. Four years later, no, that will not be the project because it will be changed. So we're living in this constant political change that, that has a big, big discourse. It's not just changing politicians. It is a change of, of course every time that goes from left to right, from right to left, from right to left. And, and then we cannot build things. They derail whatever effort you do. You have some postdocs, and the next one is another post. Now there are graduate students, and another graduate students. Now, now we have the biology. The biology is not in Now it's this. Uh, and so when one sees that there is an effort that is constant, then you could see the fruits that, that, that are happening at time. Uh, but if you just keep changing, we don't see any, any, any. So we hope that IMSA will give us this support, this constant support, so that we can see the fruits in 10 years and 20 years. Uh, and, and we need to we could use it. So, so I think myself, thank you for accepting the invitation. Higher invariance in equivalent and geometric support. What is this? Please, thank you. Okay, so uh, good morning. Uh, I would like to thank uh, to thank to the organizers for uh, for inviting me. And okay. so the plan of the talk will be. Uh, as follows. So in the first part of this talk, uh, I will explain the main ideas uh, and state some uh, results that uh, uh, some um, some basic results. So uh, then I will uh, um, I I'm going to talk uh, some some uh, words about the motivic, the so-called motivic volume of an orbifold, since this uh, will provide a very convenient framework. Uh, for uh, for the rest of the talk, and then finally I will uh, speak uh, a little bit about the string spectrum. In uh, I, I will split this in two parts, uh, namely the global and the lost local aspects. Okay, so let me start with some uh, terminology. So we're going to be interested in uh, complex uh, algebraic orbifolds. So by this, uh, I mean, uh, uh, by an orbifold, I will always mean uh, uh, the lean moon for a stack of finite type over the complex numbers. And uh, it turns out that for any such stack X, uh, we can always find an atlas, an open covering by open substacks in such a way that each shard uh, can be realized as the stack equation of a finite group acting on a on a complex algebraic variety. So it will also be convenient to um, to uh, to consider other types of stacks. So by a stack in uh, by an algebraic stack in general, I will mean uh, a stack of finite type over the complex number such that the, the stabilizers are a fine group. So I will denote the category of such stacks by this symbol here, and uh, then we have an embedding of categories. So we can embed the category of varieties into the category of orbifolds, and the category of orbifolds can be embedded as well into this bigger category of stacks. Okay, so uh, what is a string spectrum? So the idea is that the string, uh, given an, any orbifold X, 
we will construct the stringy spectrum of this X as a collection of, uh, as a finite collection of rational numbers, so that each one of them has an associated <coughs> multiplicity. So we can write down the spectrum as a linear, as a formal linear combination with integer coefficients. And we can uh, think of this, uh, of this linear combination as an element of the group algebra uh, of the rational numbers. Okay, so the idea or the main characteristic properties which uh, 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 of the stringy spectrum will be these three properties here. And in fact, the stringy spectrum will be the biggest invariant of orbitals taking values in the group algebra of Q satisfying these three conditions here. So the first one, so-called Caesar relation, is uh, telling us that this invariant will be an additive invariant. That is, whenever we have a close suborbital of X, then the stringy spectrum of X will be decomposed or can be decomposed as the sum of the stringy spectrums of the corresponding pieces. Uh, the second property, which uh, I will uh, refer as the Tom Sebastiani property, and I will explain uh, later on why is this terminology used here, is simply saying that the stringy spectrum behaves in a multiplicative uh, way. So whenever we have a pair of orbitals x and y, then the spectrum or the stringy spectrum of the product will be the product of these spectrums, and this product is taken in the group algebra with the multiplication in the in the group algebra. Okay, and the last one is uh, the k invariance of the spectrum. And this is saying that whenever we have a prepend by rational map between a smooth orbital, so x and y here are a smooth, uh, the link move for a stack of any type over the complex numbers. Uh, and this f satisfies the condition that the pullback of the canonical shift of y is just the canonical shift of x. So in that case, whenever we have such a map, then the stringy spectrum of x will be equal to the stringy spectrum of y. So this uh, is the, uh, the main invariant uh, invariance property. Sorry, so how do you define the canonical class for the orbital? Well, in this case, uh, in x and y are smooth, uh, we can define the cotangent shift uh, for such a stack. Yeah. So x and y are smooth in this case. Okay. So these are the three main properties of this invariant that I will uh, construct in this talk. So how uh, is the stringy spectrum constructed? So uh, in the case when X is proper and is smooth, then we can define the spectrum in the following manner. So uh, it turns out that for each rational number R, we can define the orbital cohomology <laughs> of X with rational coefficients uh, in the following in the following way. So this is the so-called chain run cohomology of orbitals. And uh, I will denote by this uh, by this symbol here the inertia stack of uh, or the inertia orbital of X. So I would suppose that X is proper and smooth. So we can uh, or in general we can construct the inertia stack and it decompose uh, into its connected components like this. Each one of these components are sometimes uh, called the twisted sectors of, uh, of the orbital. And so we have uh, such uh, decomposition into connected components. So for each twisted sector, we have a well-defined rational number, which is called uh, uh, the degree shifting number of the twisted sector. Uh, and uh, we can define the orbital cohomology group of X by means of this uh, by means of this uh, formula. So note that here we have uh, shifting in the in the cohomology of X, and we sum over all the twisted sectors. All right. So yeah, the inertial default it can be defined. Uh, for instance, if you have uh, a presentation of the stack by a. It's not right for the. Sorry, I had it. 
The idea is that if we, well, we can present such an orbital by a groupoid uh, in, in, in the scheme. So this is a, a groupoid scheme. And uh, in such, if, if you fix uh, this kind of presentation, then the inertia stack will be presented as well by another groupoid. But this time, um, the uh, rows, sorry, the objects of this groupoid will be just uh, I mean, for this, uh, S is given by the collection of our rows in this group. Point. So this is target, source, and target map. We have an row such that the source and target coincide. So we can take the this kind of loops in. In the or uh, in the original orbital, and this will be the objects of the inertia stack, and the arrows will be given by uh, conjugation of uh, of arrows. So we need not use that. that. And this S one, so this is another group point that we can construct out of this one, and the objects of the of the group point which represent the inertia stack has uh, this form. And the arrows will be given by conjugation of arrows. So, for instance, if we take X, let's say, uh, as the classifying stack of a finite group, then the inertia stack of this will be given in terms of uh, the conjugacy classes of of this. Like that. So this is a this is kind of. Uh, space of very tiny loops. It's, it's kind of a loop space. Okay. So this is the inertia. And the in fact, the decomposition in the sectors of this, in this case, is just a set of conjugacy classes. So the edge connected component, there is a bijection between the connected components of the inertia stack of VG and the, and the between the conjugation, uh, conjugation classes and the and the connected components of the of the inertia in that case. Okay, so now uh, it turns out that uh, if we define the orbital cohomology in that way, then each one of these groups for each R we have this uh, rational uh, vector space, and uh, it carries a fractional pure fudge structure. Of weight R. I will explain this uh, a little bit uh, better later. But uh, in any case, uh, this allows us to define or to construct out of uh, our orbital uh, an element in the Glotten de group of fractional Hodge uh, structures. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there is a map which is sometimes called uh, the formation of the spectrum. Which identifies the uh, the Grotten de group of fractional Hodge structures uh, with the group algebra of uh, of Q. So um, we have this identification, and by definition, or we can uh, use this uh, this map in order to define the string spectrum of X just as the as the corresponding elements in the group algebra like this, using the using the Hodge structure on the, the fractional Hodge structure on the orbital homology. So this is the definition when X is proper and smooth. And uh, well, uh, there is a there is a relation between uh, this uh, spring spectrum defined for orbitals in general uh, with the classical Steinberg spectrum of isolated hypersuper singularity. So the idea is that, for instance, if we have a map F defined over a smooth algebraic variety. And such that the central fiber has an isolated singularity, then we can define the spectrum of this uh, of this isolated singularity as an element in the in the group algebra of Q, and this is defined in terms of the of the monodromy on the Milner fiber of uh, such a map. So uh, 
Moreover, if we choose an embedded resolution of the singularities of X zero, in this case of the central fiber, so we can always find a, an embedded resolution of singularities in such a way that the uh, that the exceptional set uh, becomes a, a simple normal crossing divisor in the in the resolution space, and then uh, we can define or we can construct out of this data uh, the so-called root uh, stack of x uh, tilde with respect to uh, to the exceptional device. So in this case, uh, the root stack is in fact an orbifold. And uh, it turns out that this orbifold, uh, uh, that this orbifold carries all the relevant uh, cohomological information of the uh, of the Milner fiber. In other words, it is uh, closely related with the motivic Milner fiber defined by Dennett and Loescher. And in particular, this will imply that uh, the string spectrum of uh, the root orbifold will be equal to the classical Steinbrück spectrum of the isolated singularity. Okay. So now let me uh, let me talk uh, a little bit about the idea of the motivic volume for orbifolds. So. Uh, by an additive invariant of a uh, of a variety of of uh, yeah, of a variety of the complex numbers, I uh, I will mean or uh, we mean uh, just a rule which assigns uh, to any uh, variety x an element in some ring. So this is an additive invariant which takes values in the ring R. So this rule associates uh, an element in R for any variety. And uh, it is supposed that this satisfies the following three basic properties. The first one is saying that, in fact, this is an invariant of the isomorphism in class of the variety. So whenever we have a pair of uh, isomorphic varieties, then this, uh, non, uh, this element in R are equal. The, the corresponding elements in R of X and Y are equal. And uh, additivity, uh, uh, the additivity condition is uh, just uh, this one, which is similar to the uh, to the first additivity property that I uh, that I saw uh, at the beginning. So uh, we have this additivity, and for instance, or uh, if in addition uh, this rule satisfies the property that the associated number to the uh, Cartesian product of X and Y are uh, is equal to the product of the corresponding uh, uh, elements in R, then we will say that uh, such, a, such an invariant is uh, multiplicative. So uh, uh, it, it, it's, um, for the case of varieties, it is uh, um, enough uh, to define an additive invariant uh, in terms of the of the values that it, uh, that takes in the uh, in the collection of um, the smooth and proper varieties, and this is uh, basically due to the weak factorization theorem. So, uh, for example, we can define a pair of additive invariants called the Euler Poincaré and the uh, hodge delin uh, characteristic polynomials. And for any proper smooth uh, variety X, then we can define uh, this invariant just by these two formulas here. And uh, this, can, uh, this can extend to, a, to, a, um, to an invariant on the whole category uh, of varieties. OK. Now, uh, so in fact, we can uh, define a sort of universal characteristic of varieties in terms of the Grotten group of varieties, and uh, by this I mean uh, the group generated by isomorphism classes of uh, complex algebraic varieties, subject to the uh, to the scissor relations here, and we can define on this uh, ring, uh, on, sorry, on this group, uh, uh, product which is given in terms of the Cartesian product of varieties. So in this ring K uh, not uh, the um, the multiplicative identity will be just the class of the points. And uh, I will denote the class of the affine line by this L, which is called 
uh, sometimes called the leptic motif. And okay, so in this ring, uh, for instance, we can decompose the class uh, of the projective space just as a sum of the powers of L from uh, zero to N, in dimension N in this case. And this is just a, a consequence of the standard affine stratification of the projective space uh, into these affine pieces. So more generally, or in, in fact, we also have this kind of decomposition in the second line, which is telling us that uh, whenever we have an stratified vibration of varieties, then uh, the class of the, sorry, this is just X, the class of the total space of the vibration, which is this X, decomposed just as the product of the class of the fiber uh, times the class of the base. Okay, so, uh, we can uh, talk of the assignment which takes uh, any variety X into its class in the growth in the group of varieties as a sort of universal additive invariant since any other additive invariant factorized uh, to, this, to this one just by, uh, by definition. Okay, so by an uh, R value characteristic, which R is a ring, I will mean simply a ring homomorphism from the group in the group of varieties into this uh, into this R. Uh, similarly, we can define uh, the growth and the group ring of the stacks, and this has been studied by uh, by several people like uh, Ekedal or Herpan Toen. And uh, in this case, we can uh, define the corresponding growth and the ring of a stack just uh, as the ring generated by the uh, by the isomorphism classes of algebraic stacks, and we can uh, uh, we ask uh, that uh, in this ring the scissor the corresponding scissor relation holds, as well as the as the product relation given by the by the Cartesian product. However, contrary to the case of varieties, uh, for stacks we need to impose uh, another uh, relation. Uh, on this ring. And uh, so in the case of varieties, whenever we have a stratified vibration, or for instance, we have, uh, um, in particular, we have a vector bundle defined uh, over a variety, then the total space, the class of the total space of the bundle, uh, decomposes as the product of the, uh, of the class of the base times the class of the fiber. But this is, uh, uh, we need to, uh, to, um, and we need to impose this uh, restriction, uh, this, um, yeah, this restriction in the case of the stack, since it, it does not follow from the other two, other two properties, like in the case uh, in the case of Barrett. So uh, now, quite interestingly, it turns out that this uh, ring of the stacks uh, can be obtained uh, simply as a localization of the growth and the ring of varieties, and this is a result of Ekedal. So uh, so if we choose uh, or if we fix any uh, positive integer number, then uh, we can compute the class of the of the general linear group as a variety in uh, just uh, as the class of the corresponding variety. And uh, it turns out that this class decompose like this in terms of uh, the product of some polynomials in the left sets motif. Yeah, thank you. So uh, the class of the general linear group decomposed like this. And uh, since, uh, well, we can consider as well the classifying stack of uh, GLN. And uh, the point over the classifying stack is the universal GLN bundle. So uh, we can decompose the class of the total space in this case as the product of the class of the base, which is just the classifying stack of GLN times the fiber, which in this case is just the class, is given just by the class of the, of the structure group. So uh, then uh, since we have this product decomposition, this is equal just to the class of the point, which is the, uh, which is the identity in, in, the, in the ring of the stacks. So now since the class of GLN can be decomposed like this, then uh, this implies, or we can prove out of this fact, that if we invert uh, 
and we invert the left set motif as well as all these polynomials here. By infinity, I mean that I, uh, I I'm inverting all uh, these polynomials for any m. Then we, in fact, uh, recover the the Gottlieb ring of of stacks. Okay. So, uh, well, let me define the motivic ring as the localization of the Grothendieck ring of varieties by uh, after inverting the left set motif, and uh, this ring will be uh, will be um, the the ambient in which the motivic volumes or, or, or of um, of varieties of orbitals will uh, take place. But in fact, I will need to uh, to consider a further modification of um, of this uh, <coughs> ring, which is obtained by a by a uh, by a completion uh, by a completion process. So, uh, well, we can define the dimension of an element in the Gottlieb ring of varieties in a in a well, it, it is not hard to define the dimension of an element in the ring of varieties and. Out of this uh, dimension, we can construct uh, we can construct um, uh, an Archimedean seminorm uh, like this for this uh, for the motivic ring. So we have the motivic ring as well as the corresponding non-Archimedean seminorm given by the filtration by uh, and by dimension in this in this ring. And uh, let me call the completion. Of the motivic ring with respect to this seminar, the total uh, motivic ring. So this is the ring in which, in which uh, motivic volumes will uh, live. Uh, so, for example, for any positive integer, then we can uh, we can prove uh, this kind of identity. So we can uh, obtain the inverse of one minus uh, the n power of the left set motif, just as a uh, as a converging series like this in the in the total motivic uh, ring, and this implies using the Ekedal simplification of the Gottendieck uh, ring of stacks as this localization, this uh, produces a map from the from the ring of stacks into the total uh, motivic ring. Sorry, 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 sorry to ask about the settings. So you're using algebraic orbitals like the shifted no, in fact, this. Uh, and then my, my real question was whether they're compact. In fact, this uh, this category goes for the for the bigger category of the stack with the fine stabilizers, and uh, yes, we can. Uh, in, in order to um, to prove the, this, uh, well, the identification, this identification, then we need to. The stratified uh, uh, um, uh, we need to use an stratification the, the, an stratification of the stack which uh, by um, global quotient stacks with this, uh, whose uh, local group is GLN for some for some n and using this uh, kind of a stratification then and, and the fact that the <coughs> that the class of the classifying a stack of uh, of the general linear group uh, decomposed as in the previous slide, then we can prove such kind of, of equivalence. Yes. All right. So now, uh, so we, we will also need to consider um, uh, varieties or stacks or orbitals endowed with a, with a monodromic action that is an action of the group of groups of unity so we uh, will denote by mu n the group scheme of groups of unity over c defined like this is so this is a, a finite group scheme and uh, we can take the limit of these uh, finite groups and this is by definition the group the scheme of groups of unity which is a procyclic uh, uh, group and well we uh, will consider uh, varieties and though with the action of this kind uh, of varieties and though with uh, with the action of of uh, of this group of uh, of roots of unity 
And uh, we can also define the corresponding categories of the uh, orbitals with a monodromy action and, and uh, or, or more general sets with a monodromy action. And, uh, but I will always consider the strict action. So we have a group and we need to, uh, we can define uh, uh, strict uh, actions on orbitals or stack without trouble. So we can define this uh, embedding uh, of categories. And out of this embedding of categories, we have the corresponding uh, commutative uh, diagram in the, in the appropriate uh, motivic uh, rings or its completion. Okay, so on the other hand, uh, we can also define for any uh, non-negative integer, the form of uh, infinitesimal in this like this. And in fact, uh, the group of roots of unity acts by rotation on this uh, infinitesimal disk. So we can uh, take the, the limit of these actions and this uh, produce a monodromic action, uh, action by rotations on the on this uh, infinitesimal disk. Uh, moreover, we can also define the inverse limit or the form of this uh, uh, like this using the, the limit of this uh, infinitesimal or truncated uh, uh, disk. And this uh, inherits a corresponding monodromic action by a rotation. Okay, so uh, let me define uh, the twisted infinitesimal in this as the quotient stack of uh, the uh, the uh, the infinitesimal n this divided by its monodromy action, and uh, similarly we can define the twisted form of this as the stack equation of the uh, of the formal uh, this divided by the corresponding monotony gap. Okay, so uh, uh, um, so in fact we will define the string spectrum not just for uh, for a uh, for plane orbitals, but we will define the string spectrum for orbitals defined over the formal twisted uh, disk. Uh, so uh, I will consider uh, uh, orbitals defined over uh, and though with the structure map into the formal disk. So this is a stacking map. And uh, well, we can uh, take the corresponding central fiber of such a map. And for any such object, so whenever we have uh, an orbifold of a D, of the twisted disk, then we can define the twisted N R the space uh, for any N or the corresponding a twisted R space in general as the space of uh, of geometric maps or uh, stacking maps from the uh, sorry stacking sections from D into X. So we have uh, an structure map from X into D, and we define these R spaces just as the space of sections of the structure map like this. Okay, so well, uh, it can be proved that uh, if X uh, is an orbital over D, then for any integer, the twisted arc space, the corresponding twisted arc space is in fact an orbital. And this orbital is endowed with a monodromy action given by rotations of, uh, of arc. So this is kind of a uh, of an action by the parametric patients. If we think of the arc spaces as, as a sort of a space of very tiny loops in, in X, so we can endow these uh, loop spaces with a with an action of with a monodromic action uh, in this uh, in this manner. So, in particular, if we take the uh, the space of uh, of twisted arcs uh, when n is equal to zero, then it turns out that the that the corresponding twisted arc space is in fact uh, uh, or it, it is just the inertia uh, orbital of the of the central part. Of the corresponding central part. Okay. Uh, now, well, uh, besides the arc spaces, or uh, we, we have these additional truncation maps between uh, arc spaces. So for any n, uh, an m where m is uh, bigger than m, we can define the corresponding truncation map. And uh, well, uh, we can prove using these uh, truncation maps that uh, this element in the in the motivic ring so this is the um, this is the class in the 
corresponding uh, motility ring of orifice divided by the uh, or, or normalized by this uh, factor is uh, in fact or it, it has a well-defined limit in the corresponding completion of the motivic ring so we can define or we define the motivic volume of an orbital defined over d just as this limit so note that this limit since this uh, each one of these uh, uh, each the, of, of these um, are the spaces uh, has a monodromic action then uh, the limit in here is as well as a monodromic action and in fact the motivic volume uh, uh, belongs to to the corresponding monodromic version of the of the motivic ring okay so uh, using uh, some standard let's say techniques for motivic integration we can prove uh, or uh, it, it has been proved by Yasuda that uh, there is an invariance property of the uh, for the motivic volume defined like this. Uh, so whenever we have a map, a proper version of map between a smooth orbifold, which is present, so 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 that the the pullback of the canonical class is the canonical class, then uh, the motivic volumes of x and y defined like this uh, agree. Okay, so uh, moreover, if X is smooth, then uh, each one of these truncation maps is in fact a stratified vibration. And using this fact, we can prove that the motivic volume in this case is given simply by the class of the inertia stack uh, of the central fiber of X. All right, so now, uh, so now, uh, so in, in the case of uh, of varieties, so if we have a proper smooth variety X, then uh, we can define the Hodge characteristic in terms of the Hodge structure on the cohomology groups of X like this. So this is a well-defined element in the Gottendi group of, uh, of the category of integral Hodge structure. Uh, but uh, so we would like to define a similar kind of uh, Hodge characteristic uh, when uh, this the category of varieties is replaced by the category of orbitals, but we need to consider not just uh, integral Hodge structures, but fractional uh, Hodge structures as well. So, uh, uh, broadly speaking, a fractional Hodge structure is just a cube vector space, a finite dimension of cube vector space, and though with the grading by the rational numbers, and each one of these pieces is uh, uh, can be decomposed into pieces in terms of this uh, vibrating, uh, satisfying the, the standard condition that the conjugate of uh, PQ is just uh, the, uh, the degraded part QP. Okay, so uh, these uh, fractional Hodge structures can be organized uh, into a category. And in fact, this is closely related with the group of roots of unity since this uh, this category of fractional Hodge structures is in fact at the Nakian category, and the fundamental group of this uh, of this HS of Q uh, is in fact uh, just uh, well is, is just the group of roots of units. So in other words, if we take the uh, the fiber functor, which uh, forgets the 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 structure the the vibrating, and also, so we can take just uh, we can just take uh, um, Fractional Hodge structure, and we can tensor it with the complex numbers, and this gives rise to a vector, a finite dimensional vector space. If we forget the additional structure, and this is a fiber functor for H S of Q, and the automorphisms of this group, uh, in fact, recovers the the group uh, of roots of unity. So uh, this uh, produces the identification that I uh, that I state at the at the beginning of the talk, uh, so we can identify the growth in the group of uh, fractional Hodge structures with the category of representations of the uh, group of roots of unity. But this uh, this uh, case here of the of the category of, of representations is just the group algebra of Q. So a representation, a finite dimensional representation of mu, can be decomposed into into uh, into its irreducible pieces. And each uh, and so for each rational number, we have uh, 
we have an irreducible representation of mu. So if we take a finite dimension of representation of mu, we can decompose into irreducible pieces. And each one of these, uh, uh, each piece appears, each irreducible representation appears with some multiplicity, and this uh, provides the identification between uh, the the growth and the group of representations of mu and, and this uh, group algebra. Okay. So, uh, on the other hand, if we take, uh, so for instance, if we take an uh, integral Hodge structure, but uh, in such a way that it is in though with a monodromic action, that is an action of the group of roots of unity, then there is a sort of localization process which uh, which produces a fractional Hodge uh, a fractional Hodge structure, and this can be thought as a as a sort of localization at the fixed point of the of the monodromic. So the point is that this will produce a map out of the monodromic k zero of the integral Hodge structures into the Grothendieck group of fractional Hodge structures. And moreover, in fact, this, uh, this kind of localization process can be realized at the level of, uh, of, uh, of the category of orbifolds. Uh, so in that case, for a smooth orbifold or for a smooth and proper orbifold X, uh, we can uh, localize this motivic volume. So recall that the motivic volume of this thing is given just by the by the class of the inertia stack, since this is, uh, since we are assuming that X is a smooth, and uh, we can uh, we can define the localization of the motivic volume of X uh, like this. So this uh, is uh, this is a, well a kind of uh, a localization process with respect to the monodromic action by the parametrizations of uh, of arcs in the inertia stack. And uh, this uh, produce an element in the in the motivic ring of orbifolds. What we need to consider, or what we need to adjoin this uh, uh, formally, the these uh, roots of the left shift motif. Since this number here, the degree shifting numbers uh, could be could be fractions. Okay. So, well, the point here, or it turns out that. Uh, in this way, we produce or we can produce a localization map out of the monodromic motivic ring of orbifolds into this uh, motivic ring of orbifolds uh, with the with the with the corresponding roots of L adjoint. Okay, so in fact, this uh, localization map at the level of uh, of the motivic uh, ring of orbifolds uh, can it's kind of a Realization. So this is kind of a motivic realization of this localization map at the level of Hodge structure. So in other words, this is a commutative uh, diagram. So here we take just the the Hodge, uh, uh, the plane the Hodge structure in this in this case for the corresponding. This can be defined in terms of the of the usual Hodge structures for the for the for orbifolds. And we have this uh, this diagram. Okay, so um, so this in, in this way we can finally define the motivic volume of a general orbital using this uh, these two process. So we first take the motivic volume of X. So in order to define the strange spectrum of X, we can uh, first take the motivic volume. Uh, um, of X, and then we can use this uh, the, the this uh, localization process, and subsequently we can just apply the usual Hodge characteristic, and this will produce an element in the in the group of rational or fractional Hodge structure, which is identified by the formation of a spectrum, which is just a name for the for the identification of these two of these two rings, and this allows us to produce. Uh, or to construct uh, the string spectrum of a general law, which coincides with the with the uh, definition that I uh, uh, that I present yeah, at the at the beginning. Okay, so however, it is convenient 
in any case to have this realization for the spectrum like this in terms of the motivic volume and this kind of localization process because uh, uh, using uh, using uh, for instance the um, um, the uh, the chain rule uh, uh, for motivic uh, integration in the realm of orbitals we can prove uh, for example that uh, this, uh, so we can prove uh, using this kind of machinery of, of motivic integration that uh, the spectrum so defined satisfy uh, the appropriate uh, or the or, or this uh, basic uh, property. So we can prove. Uh, so the, the motivic volume is 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 uh, is an additive invariant. And each one of these maps, the localization and the Hodge characteristic are additive as well. So we have uh, for free the additive uh, property for uh, for the string spectrum defined in this way. And similarly, we have uh, well, it, it's a little more uh, more complicated to prove this uh, property here, which is related with the uh, uh, with this so-called convolution product of uh, of, uh, of Hodge structure. So well, uh, but in any case, we can prove using this definition that uh, the string spectrum of a product, the compulsion to the product of the string spectrum of each factor. And the chain rule formula for motivic, uh, in motivic integration uh, gives us the last property, which, uh, which is uh, the K invariance of the, uh, of the string spectrum. Okay, so now, uh, well, let me end. Uh, with uh, uh, with this uh, or with the relation uh, that exists between the, the string spectrum for orbitals that uh, that I uh, defined uh, in the in the previous slides and the usual uh, or the classical sorry uh, a string a string spectrum of an isolated singularity. So again, we have or we can consider a map out of a smooth variety X. In such a way that the central fiber has an isolated singularity, and uh, in that case we can uh, define, or let me define, the motivic Milner fiber of this map uh, by taking just the pullback map of uh, of this uh, of this uh, projection. So we take the the map into a one, and then we can just project into the stacky portion of a one. And by taking the pullback in the category of stacks, we construct this uh, pullback stack, which is defined over the, the twisted disk. Okay, so this is reminiscent, or it's uh, uh, this uh, most, uh, canonical Milner fiber, or the canonical Milner fiber defined in, in this way, can be thought as a sort of of uh, of, uh, of um, of a motivic realization of the usual canonical Milner fiber in singularity theory, which is defined in terms of the of the universal uh, cover of the puncture disk. So we can uh, we can uh, choose or we can take uh, the the universal cover of the of a, a suitable uh, or an appropriate uh, small disk around around zero, and we can take the pullback along this uh, universal covering and the classically the canonical Milner fiber is defined in this way but uh, this uh, covering is, is infinite so uh, so uh, this process here is uh, somewhat reminiscent of this classical construction and in fact it turns out that this kind of um complete realization of this process is so uh, on the other hand, uh, we can uh, consider or we can take an embedded resolution of the singularities of X zero like this, in such a way, again, that the exceptional set is a simple normal clo closing divisor. And uh, in that case, we can define the root stack, which is a root orbital, as I said uh, at the beginning. And well, the main result is that uh, the stack uh, or the canonical uh, Milner fiber defined in the previous slide uh, is in fact an orbifold and moreover the motivic volume of this orbifold coincides with the motivic volume of uh, the root stack. So this is the first part 
and we have this identification or this uh, this equality between the corresponding uh, mot uh, motivic volumes of these two orbifolds here. Uh, but uh, it is uh, uh, well, it turns out, or it, it has been construed by Denef and Loescher, uh, um, a motivic version, which is an element in the monodromic motivic ring of varieties associated with the with this kind of uh, of hypersurface singularity. So this is an element in the motivic ring of uh, of varieties, and it can be proved that this uh, this class uh, encodes all the relevant cohomological information of the uh, of the uh, of the monodromy action on the on the mineral fiber. So in particular, the spectrum constructed out of this out of this uh, uh, out of this element here is uh, uh, or allow us to recover the the classical Kimbian spectrum of, of singularities. And well, let me just finish with this uh, last result, which uh, is telling us that in fact uh, the stringy spectrum of the canonical Milner fiber coincides uh, with the stringy spectrum of uh, sorry with the stringy spectrum of the isolated singularity because we have uh, this uh, well, this equality here uh, allows us to identify the stringy spectrum of this particle and the stringy spectrum of this one. And it is known that, or it can be proved that the stringy spectrum of this thing coincides with the spectrum constructed out of the motivic minimal fiber of Dennis and Russia. So at the end, we can uh, compute, let's say, the, the spectrum of the singularity, in this case, using the uh, using this um, this um, canonical minimal fiber, which is uh, which is defined in terms of the of the string spectrum of the of the orbital in this case. Okay, so I think that I will stop here and thanks for your attention.